I'm from Washington State too. I said, oh yeah, whereabouts? And he, he told me, and, and I'm like, oh, small world. Do you, you like the music from up there? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I really like the music from up there. And I told him, yeah, my musical career started up there and done a lot of music. And he's like, you know, what band were you in? Because you look really familiar to me. And I'm like, well, I was in a band called Silver Scooter. And he's like, ah, pumpkin eyes. My gosh, I can't believe it. Welcome, everyone, to This Was The Scene, the podcast that takes a look back at the late 90s, early 2000s punk scene. I am your host, Mike Doyle. Before we start, my old band Landmeyer is playing a show on December 1st at the Stanhope House in Stanhope, New Jersey. Pre-sale is $15, and if you miss out on that, then it's 20 bucks at the door. I'm going to be talking about this a lot until that show, so get used to it. Link is in the show notes, or you can visit the Landmeyer Band Instagram and click on the link there to go buy some tickets. After hooking up with Peekaboo Records, Silver Scooter issued their debut 7-inch Biting My Nails, the singles Ball of Yarn and Cup and String, followed before they issued the full-length The Other Palm Springs in 97. A split 10-inch with Cursive as well as a split 7-inch with Tierra followed in 98, before the trio dropped their second LP Orleans Parish early the next year, and Goodbye followed in the fall of 2000. Blue Law appeared in early 2001. I heard of this band in 98, 99-ish when my buddy John Price introduced me to Pumpkin Eyes, which was on the Crank Records Don't Forget to Breathe comp. So I thought it would be pretty cool to find out more about these guys. So I reached out to Scott and asked him to be on the podcast. He said yes, and this is what we chat about. His 50 Songs Project, Peekaboo Fanzine, Getting a Call from Bob Mould, Dave McNair, What Pumpkin Eyes is About, They're Split with Cursive, Death Cab for Cutie Liking Silver Scooter, Getting Stuck in Japan During 9-11, his appearance on Tiny Desk Concert, his other band Super Double X-Man being the first release on Courtney Barnett's label, and a ton more. Go check out his site, scottgarrett.com, link in the show notes, where he has a ton of music and videos from all the projects he's done. Lastly, if you want to support the podcast, you can do so by paying a dollar a month on my Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash thiswasthescene. Or you can go to thiswasthescene.com and just scroll down and you'll see a button for Patreon. Or you can just do a one-time donation if you want to keep this thing alive. That's all I got to say, so feel free to subscribe, leave a review, and share this with anyone who would love some punk rock nostalgia. With that said, let's get started. So how do you say your last name? Is it Garrett? Garrett, yeah. Perfect. You got it. ScottGarrett.com. How active is this website? Um, I update it every week. Right now I'm pretty active through the blog. In fact, I've I'm a, I just make music for my own enjoyment these days. I do share it with people because there are a few people out there that want, keep tabs on what I'm doing. But I've I've found just sharing a song on my blog it used to be monthly, then it became weekly when I started doing the cover series. That's it. Sometimes I like something enough to put an album together and uh, do a little crowdfunding and press up some limited run of vinyl. But I don't, uh, I don't do a whole lot anymore. It's like the majority of your time. Do you have like kids and all that? I do. Yeah, yeah. I have a 16 year old and a 12 year old. And did you? <clears throat> we're gonna. So the way I structure this, is I'm gonna go back in time, talk about how you got in the scene in Silver Scooter, and then we can kind of branch from there a little bit. It's like super, super double X man. Is that how you say? Yeah, okay. super double X man. And, man, I'm killing it right now. Um, you are. You're on fire. <laughs> I can imagine the people, the audience listening to this is probably between the age of 35 to 50, I'd say. And a lot of them, I believe, have kids and stuff. And I think some people, as they get older, feel that, oh, I've got family responsibilities. I don't have a lot of time to do stuff. So I think it's kind of motivating that you still do this with a family. When they were really little, were you still making music? Were you more active on your website? Yeah, I mean, I was still, I was still touring up until about three years ago, and I did just do a series of house shows this summer, just limited to the Bay Area. Through it all, I, I've never been one to to stop doing what I love to do. I mean, music fuels me as much as I put into it. So the making albums and writing songs is. I guess it's been more important to me doing that than caring too much about who I reach with the music. I mean, I, I've my productivity hasn't slowed down. My desire to play little shows when they pop up hasn't slowed down. But trying to build a fan base has really slowed down. I think that's inspir- and I think it's pretty inspiring. 
I haven't written music. And the only time I write songs was when 20 years ago I was, was in a band, wrote my first handful of songs. And then after that, did another band. And then after that, when I was doing some acoustic stuff, when I was really bummed out for a breakup, and then I got divorced and did a couple songs. So it's like, it's almost like I have to have something life-changing happen for me to write music. And then I just feel like I'm stifled. Did you ever have a point where, when you started just, like, when you had a conversation with yourself, you're going, I'm just going to just write because I just want to. And prior to you deciding that, were you kind of like, well, there has to be a reason for me. There has to be an album or there has to be a tour for me to do this. It's never had to be a tour because I've never been that active as a touring artist. But albums, I've always thought that I should try to do something once a year. And then I think it slowed down to maybe once every two years. I, I, I really still love the album format. And I, and I try to assemble an album to maybe have a loose theme. That's really important to me, to, to always chase that idea of writing all the time. Then it's really just a feeling that I get when I think, okay, I'm ready to make an album. Like I can... I've been doing this cover project intensely for a year and a half now, and making cover songs is a whole nother ball game. It's probably a whole nother conversation. But now that I'm officially done with all the songs, I have them all lined up, ready to release. I only have seven more weeks of it to go, and then I turn 50, and then my 50 songs project is over. Oh, so was that it was a 50 because you were lean, going from 49 to 50 and that's where you're like this is where the number came from? Yeah, I'll just explain it really quickly. Yeah, um a couple years ago I said, you know, I'm turning 50 on December 10th of 2022 this year. So a year and a half ago I started exploring songs that have been meaningful to me either because I love the songwriter or I love the performance. Somehow, I've managed to find 50 songs throughout my life, from when I was a little kid to now, that I f felt like I could put in my voice, record, and release. I, I won't release them on Spotify or anything, because I think that it would be crazy to pay all the royalties or mechanical royalties, whatever the terminology is. I don't... I can't afford to do that, but plus it's like fifty. I think it's like fifty bucks a month too to host them on there. Yeah, it's it's quite expensive. I've done a couple cover songs digitally here lately, and it's like, whoa, I have to pay for that every year, don't I? I'm really careful about releasing a cover song, but I'm sharing them, and I I, I put it out there. If, if for some reason the artist gets wind of it or something, and they want me to take it down, I don't have a problem doing that. But I don't think anybody's going to come after little old me doing a few cover songs. I think it's cool, man. Your website's really, it's awesome. If anyone listening, they sh you should go check it out. Scott Garrett, two R's. I'll link to it in the show notes. But it's a cool site because it's, it's almost like, it's, it's neat because it just shows, it's got the 50 Songs Project. It's about your history. It's got some video. It's got your blog. It's almost like a place you can kind of personally visit and just be, this is my world that I've created and I can add to it the way that I want to. And it keeps me kind of juiced in this whole thing that I've got going. That's good. I'm glad that you find it that way, because that's the whole point. And your feedback is enough for me to <laughs> keep, you keep, keep it going. <laughs> <laughs> I know. In the picture of your studio, man, if I had a house with an extra room, I would definitely want to have something like that. That's so cool. Uh, that's, uh, that's thanks to my uh, wonderful wife for allowing me that space. And I share that room with my 12-year-old when they come stay with us. <laughs> that's awesome. To go back in time and start the whole music journey, really, I mean, you could talk about probably bands you did before Silver Scooter, but that's the one that got me into wanting to do this interview because I remember the Crank Records compilation that came out and Pumpkin Eyes, I think, was the first song on the CD, maybe? I think it might be the first song on that. It's either the first or the third. It's it's in that sweet spot of you pop a compilation on and it's like, it's one of the songs that you get hit with first. So I think a lot of people, I think a lot of people share your your history with that song. Yeah, I, I can't even remember. I know that Crank on their website, because I just talked to um, Jeff. Oh, really? Yeah, I got because this whole thing started, and his, his, his interview is going to come out, I believe, a week 
or two before yours. Or I think it's a week mm. before yours. So it's kind of funny just the way it's going to go. But because I keep going through my brain about all the little, like the bands that, the you know, the, the big names that we always listen to. But I was like, I want to go back to the like those moments where there was a compilation and this one song and this one band, this one label. And that's where this, that's where I like, to me, like my podcast is kind of like your website. This is where I get to just express almost like open the doors for myself when I was 18. And when I thought of you, I don't know how it came about, but I was like, I, sh- I totally want to get this on. Because me and my buddy, John Price, who I told him, I was like, I'm interviewing someone you're going to really love. We used to crank like Pumpkin Eyes when we'd be at East Stroudsburg for the weekend, like when he was going there. And we just cranked that song as we're going to get beers or something. And we just always just played it all the time. So it's just like, even that little moment made me, I was like, I have to do this interview just because of that. And then open up, open it up to see what your world was like back then. That's awesome. Yeah. And then that led to Jeff and then talking about crank and stuff. So, so for you personally, uh, did you grow up in Austin? No, I grew up in Eastern Washington on the border of Washington and Idaho. But Silver Scooter was based in Austin, right? Yes. Uh, Tom Hudson and I played music together in Eastern Washington and Idaho. We had a couple different band names. I won't get into all the history there, but Tom and I graduated at the same time from our respective colleges, and we we said we we really want to keep playing music together. It's you know we felt that it was very special what we did together. We somehow ended up in Austin. If Tom were telling the story now, he would say that he flipped a coin on a map and nudged it over to Austin because it landed in the proximity of, you know, maybe landed on Waco or something like that. And so he nudged it down to Austin. And he's uh, he's into computers and technology and stuff. And in the mid-90s, Austin was a, a good spot for him to uh, to want to go and explore work. I didn't really care where I went. I just wanted to play music with Tom. What was it about playing with him that was so special? Tom is one of the most natural musicians I've ever played with, and he's a drummer beyond drummers. He just has an incredible feel for the music. And something that he told me early on in my songwriting process was he just plays to the vocals. He's a drummer that just really thinks about the vocal melody, whatever I'm expressing as a songwriter and a singer, that's what's driving him. So that to me, I I just knew that, yeah, I think that's what it's about to me too, because I can tell when he plays drums that there's just something really tightly connected there. You can actually, I was listening to the record, which record is that? Uh, The other Palm Springs, so going through it. And you can definitely hear that where he does play to that, like play to your vocals. Tom's one of my my best friends. In fact, a funny story. He just sent me a text. He was at a party with a bunch of people that used to go to our shows in Austin. It was a costume party, I guess. So he's, he claimed that he dressed up as me. (laughs) And then he and somebody did a duet to pumpkin eyes at this party. It was like a nineties music party. (laughs) Was this recent? Yeah. Just like last weekend or something. That's really random. Yeah. <laughs> That's so random. That's pretty funny. <laughs> did you, so which part of Washington did you grow up in? I grew up in a little town called Clarkston, Washington. So you'll notice there's a song on the other Palm Springs called Clarkston, Washington. I was going to ask about that because I thought that that was kind of like a nod to, because I know you live in Portland. No, you live in San Francisco, but you did live in Portland for a minute. Yeah, I've bounced around here and there. But uh, Clarkston was affectionately known as the other Palm Springs. That first album was just kind of a nod to my hometown. So when you grew up there, was there were you involved? Because this this pot this podcast is based around like the, the the scene, meaning like the punk emo ska scene, where indie was involved in that. And this is mid '90s where Fat Records comes into play, and that gets a lot of attention, and it brings a lot of people in. But then our minds start to expand because records labels like Crank come into play, and like eventually Jade Tree. So there's there's kind of this more musical bands come out and that's where you guys come in. So were you involved in like the scene, I guess to say when, when you were in Washington before you moved to Austin? Yeah, we, um, now these are really, really small university communities. When school isn't in session, there's maybe 15 or 16,000 people in these little towns. So there wasn't really a scene per se. 
but there were there were always really great bands, really great punk rock bands. I was in the skateboarding scene and punk rock scene from early high school on. There seemed to always be just an incredibly cool band in Pullman, Washington or Moscow, Idaho. They inspired me enough to want to go to school up there, which was only 30 miles from my house, and start playing music. And it wasn't long at all before I met Tom and another friend of ours, Sean Camp, who later joined Silver Scooter for the third album that we made. What so, he, did he play? Uh, he played bass mostly when we played together in the Northwest. I wasn't as much into that Crank Records Jade Tree scene as much as I was influenced by, oh, probably more music going on in Olympia, Washington, K Rock, K, K Records, and Kill Rock Stars type bands. That stuff sort of influenced my early songwriting. What were some of the bands from that scene? Because you, you definitely hear Built to Spill. In yeah, Beat Happening, uh, Built to Spill. We used to go down to Boise and play at the bar, and Doug Marsh bartended at the Neurolux. And we would either play an all ages show in Boise, Idaho, and then go to the bar and see early incarnation of Built to Spill, or we would play at the bar and Doug would be bartending. And so we got to know him a little bit. He helped us get some of our first serious recordings made. And so we we were all very influenced by that scene. Other bands, let's see, Built to Spill, the Halo Benders, Beat Happening, uh, Link. So many amazing bands out of that area. I can't even think of all of them right now. Was there kind of like a local... I think a lot of areas had that local... Definitely. Yeah, what was the... It's like you, you're... Not fan base, but people really loved their local bands that that was happening up there where you were yeah, yeah yeah and the local bands in western washington were they weren't just local bands they were to me they were world renowned bands they had a following all over certainly all over the united states and a lot of bands overseas a lot of people overseas like that scene too some i don't know something about that scene i feel like there's something about just the north west in general it's just so big like nature wise that i feel like there's got to have some kind of effect on the sound for some reason like the raininess or just i don't know it just seems like it's not rugged but kind of rugged yeah and i i think part of that scene is um fairly remote you know the the small towns are really small and and the big cities like Portland and Seattle, certainly in the early 90s and late 80s, they, they weren't big metropolitan areas. They weren't super diverse places to be. So there there's just really unique music and art coming out of cities like that, I thought. I always thought. So when you guys are up there, you start Silver Scooter in Washington? No, we started it in Austin. So the two of you were just like, let's start a band and let's go to Austin and we'll do it there. Yeah, we, we had played through all of our college years in bands and loved playing together. And Tom and I said, we're not breaking this up. Let's move to Austin together and we'll keep it going. And we, we found a bass player that we liked enough to start doing some gigs. We played an early show with Spoon when they were also starting out at a little place called The Hole in the Wall. And in the audience at The Hole in the Wall was our bass player, John Hunt. And we hinted to John that we were probably going to kick this bass player out. And he said, well, you guys can come down to my house and start practicing and I'll fill in for you until you find somebody permanent. And I mean, he, he played on all three Silver Scooter albums and all the recordings we ever made. And if you ever listen to the, the bass specifically on those Silver Scooter albums, it's quite unique and pretty incredible. Yeah, I was catching that when I was listening to the the one record, especially. I really have been going back to Tractor Pull a lot. I really like that song. Mm. That's a good song. Thank you. Yeah, yeah it's a great thank opener. You. And you, yeah, you could you could definitely hear that bass that there's just he's going off in his own world, but it matches what you're doing. Yeah, I remember. I remember the very first practice that we played that song, Tractor Pull. I remember writing it and strumming it, and it had more of a slow lilt to it, and I showed it to Tom and John, and they just pushed it in that direction that you hear on the album. And that was one of the cool things about 
Silver Scooter, I thought, was the, the chemistry between the three of us, Tom, John, and I, made a really unique sound. It reminded me a, a little bit of Northwest bands. It reminded me a little bit of Super Chunk, I guess, because I was really influenced by Super Chunk in my early songwriting. Tom and I really liked the bass to be played with a pick. We liked that contrast of a clean sound and then an overdriven sound. And that just, I don't know, whatever Silver Scooter became, it didn't take that long for it to get there. It kind of just became that sound overnight once John started playing with us. When you're talking about it, them kind of speeding the song up, it just reminded me of that thing you do where the, the drummer just starts playing the song faster because it was like a ballad. And he's like, no, yeah. it has to be faster. And there's like, yep, he was right. Yeah, and, and I think the way John played bass is a lot of downstrokes. So not a lot of, he fills up a lot of space with it. And the way I play guitar is I fill up a lot of space. And so I think Tom and John together pushed a lot of the early songs that we did up into a faster tempo. What were your thoughts on that? Because a lot of your songs, I was actually going to ask you, because you have a very kind of like melancholy style when I'm listening to like majority of stuff. Like I'm listening to the rest of the album and then I'm listening to Super Super Double X Man and then just the stuff on your... Actually, that was listening to that on your website. Like you have a very slow, kind of somber sound. Yeah. Well, I think I think if Tom and John played with me throughout Super Double X Man and on my little Scott Garrett solo albums that I've done, they'd probably all sound a lot more like Silver Scooter. They'd probably have a lot more energy. It wasn't really until the Blue Law, the third album, that I realized that, you know, I'm I'm trying to sing way too high. Like, this is not natural for me. I need to bring it down a little bit and sing in a lower register. I, I like the Blue Law the, the best out of the three albums that we made. Uh, just because I, I felt like I was finally starting to sing a little bit better. So when you guys are in Austin, I'm just going off like Discogs, and it basically it's saying that Biting My Nails, is that the first release that you do? Yeah, that's the first 7-inch that we did. So how's that happen? Well, Tom and I would go to parties, and we met a few people at a few Austin parties who were also in a lot of great local bands that came out of Austin, a garage rock scene that produced the 145s and later oh, tons of God, I'm drawing a blank. I don't want to just give you a bunch of dead air while I think of bands, but, but we met, uh, we met Travis Higdon and Travis Higdon is one of my best friends and he's one of the first people that we met in Austin and he had already been doing this fanzine called Peekaboo. And Peekaboo slowly became a record label, too, because he released some stuff, some early Drake Tungsten stuff, which was Britt Daniels' four-track project, and some early Spoon singles. And he approached us to do a 7-inch, and that was the Biting My Nails 7-inch. It wasn't long after that that we recorded the version of Pumpkin Eyes for the Crank Comp, because... Once we did the one seven inch, the biting my nail seven inch, we had known Mineral also practiced at John Hunt's house. Oh, I didn't even think that they were also down there. So we knew all those guys. And I think by the time Silver Scooter was really actively playing, I think they were probably already the Gloria record is what I'm thinking. So so we knew we knew Chris and Jeremy pretty well. They must have introduced our music to Jeff. I don't know how Jeff discovered Silver Scooter, but we ended up recording Pumpkin Eyes for him. And then we also recorded a, a seven inch that Crank put out. Yeah, Cup and String? Yeah, yeah, the Cup and String one. I'm cheating right now because I'm a, reading it. <laughs> no, that's okay. There's a good sidebar story to that one too. But let me let me try to stay on track here. Peekaboo with Travis this is how releasing our albums on Peekaboo as opposed to Crank happened. Jeff wanted to sign Silver Scooter, and we were basically going to do it. There was no reason for us not to because we, we wanted to make an album, and that was, our, that was our best offer, and it felt good, and we liked Jeff, and uh, we knew that, that that compilation 
you know, was getting heard far and wide and people like that song Pumpkin Eyes. But when we all woke up the next day, we all had a call from Travis and Travis said, you know, I went to the bank yesterday and I got approved for a personal business loan and I've done all the numbers and I want Peekaboo to release Silver Scooter's debut album. And we're like, Travis is one of our best friends. That was it for us. Probably in hindsight, if we would have went with Crank, we probably would have reached a lot more people. But we made the decision that we did. And I certainly have no regrets about it because I, I feel like the three albums that we made and released on Peekaboo, that was just a perfect. There was nothing short of perfect about it. It all felt really, really good to me. Do you think it would have kind of skewed your relationship a little bit with him? If you didn't with with Travis, yeah, maybe I don't know. It's kind of fun to play around a little bit. No, not at all, not at all. Because he he probably would have been relieved, being like, "Oh, good, God, okay, <laughs> I don't need to do the business loan now." Well, he did a lot of releases on that label. I mean, he did a lot of releases on that label, and uh, I think finally, finally, the Octopus Project was probably. I would imagine that they far outsold anything Silver Scooter did with him. Yeah, I was gonna say I'm going down the list, and all of a sudden it's just like 2007, 2010. It's like Octopus Project, like just that's all in a row, and then it goes out. So it doesn't really. There's like no other bands were getting released on the label until between 2017 and 2010 and 2013. Yeah, yeah. So before that happened, though, and this is an interesting little story. I've shared this on my blog, but you know, the 20 readers of my blog know the story. My first job in Austin was, I always worked in custom black and white photo labs. Tom calls me up at work one day and he's like, you got to you gotta call home and check the messages. And I'm like, okay. And so I called home and Bob Mould had called Tom and I, and because Bob Mould lived in Austin. This was after Sugar and when he was doing early Bob Mould solo albums before he r returned to the really high energy rock that he's doing now. And he said, you know, I really like your guys' music and I understand you have a lot of songs. Would you like to get together for coffee so we can talk about maybe doing some recording? And I'm like, at that point in my life, Bob Mould was one of my biggest influences. I really looked up to Bob Mould. I love Sugar so much and Husker Du albums and like, is that really Bob Mould calling on my answering machine? That's so weird. It's crazy. So I called him back, and Tom and I went to meet him for coffee. We ended up hanging out with Bob a lot for maybe six months or so. And at one at one point at, at South by Southwest, we sat around his kitchen table and met with him and his lawyer, and we talked about what a record deal would look like. And we walked, and this was before Peekaboo and before Crank. I think we had maybe just recorded that. Well, I think we probably had done the Biting My Nails 7-inch, and I had done a, two Super Double X Man cassettes, which somehow Bob got a hold of. We would be over at Bob's house a lot, and Tom and I would play a lot of mini golf with Bob and get milkshakes and just do goofy stuff and have fun. Whatever happened sitting around his table fizzled out. I, I think he moved away to Atlanta is what I heard to write for professional wrestling or something like that. I mean, I, I have no idea what he did with his life after that, but we didn't have any way of getting a hold of him. I, I didn't have an email address for him. I just had his phone number, which was, wasn't his phone number anymore after he left. But he didn't want to put his name on it, but he helped us mix he helped me mix that cup and string seven inch that we did for crank and i think if you look on the seven inch there's a little thanks bob etching when the when the grooves run out it says thanks bob oh shit <laughs> was, on the seven inch itself yeah that was uh, that was jeff's little quiet way of thanking bob but i think you know for probably lots of reasons bob didn't want to have his name on something like that because i'm sure he has to be pretty careful about what he puts his name on but, that's amazing did he yeah. ever find out about that did you ever hear i don't know i've tr i've tried to track bob down i've gone to see him play and i've brought lps to him to pass to him with a little note but i've never i've always wanted to see him and say hi again but i've never 
not since 1996 have I seen him. Oh my god, that's so crazy. That's a cool little thing that you can. I didn't realize that you could like etch things on a uh, on vinyl until recently. I started just really getting into it, and there's certain records where the other side is just sometimes it'll be a little artwork or or something like yeah, that. just the etching, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So when you guys record the other Palm Springs and that comes out of Peekaboo, what starts to happen with the band? Um, we went on tour immediately. Did you In want fact, a tour? Did you like? Were you looking forward to touring? Yeah, yeah. We had bought a van and everything. We were ready to go. We had to be really careful about it because Tom had a very serious job. I had a job, but I I could always get another job like I had. So if I lost my job, I wasn't going to be too worried about it. I really just wanted to play music. I wanted to tour and I wanted to do it all. We actually left on tour before the CDs and the vinyl of the other Palm Springs were actually ready. It was, I don't think we really anticipated and understood the delay. So we didn't have anything to sell except our singles for the first week of our first tour, I think. But then Travis found a way to send a box to us somewhere so um it ended up being a pretty good little first tour seemed like every three months we went out for a tour that lasted about three weeks we'd alternate which side of the united states we'd go out on yeah because you're like dead center kind of and that's a huge drive to go in either direction before you see anything yeah what we'd always end up doing is a little portion of the midwest on each tour and then we'd either concentrate on the East Coast or the West Coast. Where did you have the most, I'm air quoting, success? You know, I have a really nice book that a photographer put together for us. We brought a photographer on our very, very last tour. And there was a nice little club in the East Village in New York called Brownies that's not there anymore. And we played there on a Monday night and we headlined. And the room was pretty darn full. And I'm like, you know... This feels really, really good that people will finally come out to see us in a city like this on a Monday night. So uh, probably the Northeast is where we did the best. And New York's a hard, it's a hard sell in the city, depending. I mean, Coney Allen High was big back then. Uh, Brownies, I'm trying to think of, um, oh God, there was the Continental. There's just like a bunch of clubs, and there's really no scene in New York. It was just people coming from outside of the city usually to go see shows. We did the CMJ thing a lot, too, every every chance we got. I mean, that's going to bring a lot more people in, which is helpful. Yeah, and we played something official for them. We were like in a in a Broadway theater doing something during the daytime. I forget what it was. We were all so tired. I don't even remember playing the show. It was probably the most uninspired we've ever sounded but on the biggest stage we could possibly be on. That was the third album? That was a tour on the third album? No, that was that was, that was was probably right around the second album that we did. We did a CMJ where we... I think we did smart things. We always, we always did compilation appearances on other small regional labels. So Kindercore Records, which was based out of Athens, Georgia, had a really good compilation that we had a, a song on. Whenever we played in a in a city where there was another small label hosting the show, those were always the best shows. We'd have good shows at like a place like the Forty Watt Club in Athens, Georgia, just because the scene is small there and everybody's talking about it, and there's not a whole lot to do on the Saturday night. So, you know, those kind of shows end up being pretty good. Yeah, Athens was a weird place to play. We played there a couple times. The band I was in and and. We played this band called Whippersnapper. They were from there, so even they couldn't really fill the room. And they were on Lobster Records, and you know, like kind of a known label. But well, the Forty Watts a huge place. I mean, I think it was we played there. Was the stage kind of? I, I mean, I, I think back in the day, at some stages, and they just they seemed like they were so high off the ground. But then people, yeah, it was, like, a, it was a big club. It was the um, there was a record store right next to it. Um, it might have been an old theater. That's the only place we ever played when we went to Athens. Super Double X Man played a couple other places, but I don't remember the names. So you guys get you do the cup and string seven inch on Crank, and then you had the p- potential to get on Crank with your first album, and you don't. You go on Peekaboo, and then so after you do the first record on Peekaboo, and Crank gets Pumpkin Eyes. Is Pumpkin Eyes? You said that comes that gets on their comp before it's on your full length. Yeah, those are two different recordings. Um, we had recorded our first single with John Croslin, 
who was a Austin legend. I think his band was called the, the uh, I can't remember what his band was called in the 80s. He was in a really successful Austin band in the 80s. But he was the engineer and producer of the early Spoon albums. So we recorded Pumpkin Eyes with him. And then later we re-recorded it for the other Palm Springs album with Dave McNair. I should say a shout out to Dave McNair too. He's a superstar producer and mastering engineer now who's worked with everybody from Los Lobos to Willie Nelson. And he he loved our band, Silver Scooter. He recorded our albums for next to nothing. He just loved the music so much that he just found ways to help us make those albums. That's why those albums sound so good. I mean, they're really good sounding albums for for independent music. Yeah. Every place we went, they're like, how do, how do you guys get the drums to sound like that? And the guitars. And I'm like, well, we got lucky that this guy, Dave McNair, loves our band. And he really knows what he's doing. I was going to say, I was like, did he put a little bit of extra love in it because of that? But it sounds like that was the answer. The answer is yeah. Well, he only does stuff one way. He's just a passionate guy. And he just loved us. We loved him. And we were all kind of family. And I think the budget to make the other Palm Springs was enough for Dave to probably buy groceries, some new microphone stands, get his 24-track tape deck aligned, and maybe block out you know, a few weekends over the course of three months or so so that he could do it. And then to mix those albums, it seemed like he always called in a favorite, a, a bigger studio that had a bigger board that you know he could really focus and listen. So we recorded in some pretty weird spots sometimes. I think one album that we made, we recorded in a real proper studio. Everything else was always in a garage or a house. After that album? Um, all those albums. The Other Palm Springs was recorded in a house on Dave's 24-track 2-inch machine and then mixed in a studio in Austin. The uh, um, Orleans Parish was the only one that we tracked and mixed in the same studio. And then the other, the, uh, the Blue Law was mostly recorded in Dave's converted garage. I mean, it was a legit studio. It was an amazing place that we called Albert Hall. And then he mixed that at a quote-unquote proper studio. Yeah, because I was listening to the other Palm Springs when I p played it on Spotify, and I was like, "This shit holds up, man. It's it's like produce. I mean, it sounds like this. It's big. It's a yeah. It's a really yeah. good record. Well, that's that's Dave. Dave's amazing. And I never ask this question. I literally never ask how a band gets their name. I never ask them about songs. But this one's because it's so specific about how I thought of this interview have you ever told the story about what pumpkin eyes is about in an interview have i i don't remember i mean the song is it's kind of dumb i i was at a <laughs> halloween party and had a crush on someone and let the impression of that night was embodied in the lyrics to that song pumpkin eyes how'd you get pumpkin eyes though where did that come from just the fact that it was halloween and then there must have been a couple jack-o'-lanterns sitting around. Oh, it's almost like the view you were looking through, in a sense. Yeah, maybe. And there, were, and I remember there was a swing set in the in the yard at the party, and I remember sitting on the swings. <laughs> that's cool. I mean, isn't it like I think "Hey Delilah"? That sounds about some girl that the guy I think was just had a crush on and didn't even know her or something. Yeah, I I'm sure. I don't think there's a deep story to a lot of uh, songs that have made an impression on people i don't i think that's usually the thing though it's the songs that took a minute to write or something and people are like yeah i just kind of did it and you're like it's amazing how that just became something because i mean that song has got like sixty four thousand downloads or something on spotify it's the biggest you know it's the biggest downloaded played one on your your page so obviously awesome. yeah so obviously there's something about that song that really hits with with a lot of people yeah you know i'll tell you a funny little sidebar and it has that song again is I used to skateboard religiously in my youth. And now in my late forties, I'm skateboarding again, almost as hard as I used to skateboard when I was a teen. That's awesome. And so I'm at the skate park the other day and this guy that I've seen multiple times finally, finally learned his name the other day and we exchanged numbers 
and my my phone number is still a Western Washington number, and he's like, "Oh, Washington State. I'm from up. I'm from Washington State too." I said, "Oh yeah, whereabouts?" And he, he told me, and and I'm like, "Oh, small world. Do you, you like the music from up there?" And he's like, "Yeah, yeah, I really like the music from up there." And I told him, "Yeah, my musical career started up there, and done a lot of music." And he's like, "You know, what band were you in? Because you look really familiar to me." And I'm like, "Well, I was in a band called Silver Scooter." And he's like, "Ah." Pumpkin eyes. <laughs> My gosh, I can't believe it. And so we're just two dudes at the skate park and our worlds just collided. I love that. That was just last week. This is like a it's like between that and then between um what's his name? Tom? Or yeah, yeah, Tom. yeah, Tom playing that song, right? The other like that's so funny. And now we're talking about it. it's like a tri- it's like trifecta. We're talking about an interview and you had two other things happen. That that song has been really good to us. It's uh yeah, lucky. I was actually going to ask. I was like, "Do you ever want to get away from that song?" No, we did joke about it for a while, selling it to like a pumpkin pie, <laughs> like selling it to a canned pumpkin filling for, you know, pumpkin pies. Yeah, like pumpkin pies. I think Travis and a, and another friend had cooked up that scheme back when we were still in Austin. We were like, that could be a really good idea to sell the song to a pumpkin pie filling company that'd be hilarious i mean it would definitely take away from the the song itself but at that point man get those checks why not yeah i (laughs) i don't think i don't my music is so small time i don't know if i'd ever attach any of my music to anything that commercial i think it was just a joke I mean, it's, I could already start imagining what the commercial would look like. It's just like slow motion with people running around like pumpkin pies or something. Yeah. <laughs> there was a guy doing a documentary in Washington State. He contacted me and he was about to pull the trigger on it, pay us some money to use the song in a documentary film he was making about the biggest pumpkin growing competition in Washington State. And I kind of thought, oh, that's kind of funny. That'd be kind of cool. I feel like that would be keeping true to the roots. Yeah, but that that never came to be. But music and advertising is like, God, I don't know what I was just listening to the other day. And I'm like, I can't believe that song is in that commercial. It just totally ruins it for me. Yeah, that, there is a point where I don't think I've ever listened to a commercial where I was like, oh, good. I mean, sometimes I just think good for the band. But then I'm like, I can never listen to the song without thinking of this car or whatever I just saw happen. Except I think the one time when a side from the Weaker Thins was in the Wedding Crashers at the very end. Mm, I think movies are okay. I, I I would love to have a song in like a pivotal movie scene or something like that. That'd be cool. But... Well, that was done in the credits, which was weird. So it was almost like instead of you think that that song would be done towards like a running scene where he's trying to like get back the girl in the, the final scene or something. But it's like in the credits and you're like, why did they save this for here? It's so odd. I don't know that song right when the credits roll in a movie. That's a that's a memorable song too for you know whatever movie. If you enjoy the movie and the credits start to roll and a cool song comes on, you remember that song. I mean, yeah, obviously, you know, it's like a nice bookend, I guess. Yeah. So when you guys, so I guess my question before about Crank is that you you say no to putting the full length on Crank, and then in '98 you do a split with Cursive. So I guess was he still pushing to have you guys on the label, and that was his way of trying to be like, hey, I'm still here. No, I don't think Jeff was trying to get us back on the label, but we always had a really good relationship with Jeff. And we always saw Jeff and his uh, staff that did the label with him. Whenever we would go out to Los Angeles, we would see him or stay with him. or He was always involved in whatever show we might have played. So we always had a good relationship with, with him. I don't remember how the cursive split came about. It's... And it's funny, too. I bet Cursive would say the same thing. It's like, to this day, like, who the hell is Silver Scooter? And I'm kind of like, who the hell is Cursive? Oh, really? Uh, their songs have come on, like, a Spotify thing or a Sirius XM radio station. I'll be like, oh, I really like this song. Oh, it's Cursive. <laughs> like, I, I don't know. I don't remember how we got paired with that band. It never really made sense. I think it makes total sense, actually. Oh, well, so, there you go. Yeah, I mean, I didn't, I did not get into them until, man, like the like 2008 ish, maybe. Someone had sent me some, like, I think she like made me some CDs with that Ugly Organ and 
Happy Hollow, and I had never really liked them. And then I listened to those. I was like, these records are great. Like they're a really good fucking man. So I guess my when I was asking that question, it was going to be how exciting was that to do that split? And you're like, we didn't even know who they were. Yeah, I, and I feel kind of I feel kind of dumb saying that because uh, you know if I knew now what if, if I knew then what I know now, of course hindsight is beautiful, right? We would have we would have been calling cursive and writing to them and saying, hey, let's do a little tour together. Let's really let's do something and, you know, commemorate this. Let's, you know, we don't know each other, but let's get to know each other and do something. We never played with them in Omaha or anything. Yeah. I don't think they were that. I think it, when I'm looking at their discogs, it's like 2000 is where Domestica comes out. And then Ugly Organ comes out in 2003. So you guys were a while behind. I'm thinking, I mean, that's where they really mm. broke out. So you still had a ways to go. Uh, but I think locally... And, and we just though, didn't last that long. Yeah, because you guys were done by 2000? 2001. 2001, yeah. So, I mean, it would probably like they probably had a big local fame going on. I don't really know the whole story, of course, but I just know like later on where they're... I mean, they, they're huge still. Like, I mean, they could do they can go on tour and do really well now. But I guess then it just... They were kind of like, oh, yeah, I guess we would know who they were. We had an opportunity to get on Barsook, records because uh, the death cab for cutie guys really liked silver scooter that's cool so we played some shows with them and then one time super double x man was on tour of the west coast and those guys all came to see my show and i went to a party with them afterwards and i met the barsook people yeah, was that that was their guitarist i forget his name who was in death cab and he's not in anymore He has like that superman thing like Chris studio. Walla. Chris Walla, yeah. Chris that's... Walla, yeah. He didn't run Barsu. Who who did? I mean, I think his name was Jeff too. I think he just recorded a lot of their stuff. Yeah, in, he in recorded a lot of their stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So we became friends with those guys, and before the other Palm, before I keep saying the other Palm Springs instead of the Blue Law, Barsuk asked to put out the Blue Law album, and I said, no, it's it's a done deal. We're going to do it with Peekaboo, and it'll probably be our last last album. And I had higher expectations for Super Double X Man. I kind of thought maybe Super Double X Man could be like a on a bigger label. And you were doing it at the same time at towards. The I was end. doing it at the same time. Yeah, yeah. What made you wanted to have a double duty going on? Well, technically, Super Double X Man was before Silver Scooter. Before we had a bass player, Tom encouraged me to release all of my four track recordings, and so I started Super Double X Man, and then we quickly met John, as I said earlier in the interview, and we formed Silver Scooter, but that was already after I had done a couple cassette tapes. So was Super Double X Men just you, or did you... Yeah, just me, but whoever wanted to play. Tom played on a bunch of it. Travis Higdon played on a song or two. Many, many people have played on Super Double X Men recordings. I feel like that's kind of a decent way to go when you're just... I'm going to write these and whoever wants to back me in the recordings or to show, because then it just makes it a lot more loose and st less stressful, maybe. Yeah, I think I've burned a lot of bridges, though, doing it, too, because anywhere I lived, like in Portland, Oregon, Super Double X-Men was the main thing that I did. And there are probably 12 people that were in Super Double X-Men over the near 10 years that I lived in Portland. And we're all friends, but then I moved to Australia and I kept Super Double X Man going. You know, it's just, I hope that I haven't um, burned any bridges, but I mean, it's, it's not like I made any money doing Super Double X Man. So there, I, I ho just hope there's not people that I've played with that are like, yeah, that's Scott just using us for our musical talent. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like that's the, the verbal contract you're signing up front. It's just, hey, I'm just doing this thing. If you want to fill in, great. But I'm just, this is going to be my gig moving forward. Yeah, I've, I was always up front with people. Look, I don't, I don't do this for money. I just do it for fun. And it seems like we get along. We should make some music together. I mean, it's like it's the kind of the safe way to do it, I think. Then you don't have to really tie your, you know, if you're writing the mo majority of the songs or all the songs, you don't have to tie your future to somebody because that's where the stress comes in and resentment. So what were you guys like? So leading up to you guys putting out your final album, what was the inner workings like with the band? Were you guys getting along? Were you on tour? Um, how did, what did that look like? Yeah, we always got along 
pretty well. Touring in those days was really hard because nobody had a cell phone. John John would always do something that really it really pissed us off at the time. I know there's no hard feelings today. We would all be laughing about this, but it seemed like John always had a relative in a city that we played in. And I remember one time we played in Portland, Oregon. John disappears at the end of the night with his uncle. And I don't even know how he found John the next day because he went to stay with his uncle. And we're like, God, how do we find John? We got to get on the road. We have to be in Seattle by whatever o'clock. And we can't even find John. How do we do this? And he, you know, he must have written a note for us and stuffed it in the the money bag that, you know, we sold T-shirts and records with saying, here's the address. And we'd have to look in the, what were those big maps called that you'd get at the gas station? We'd have to look at the city map and try to find the street. And God, we got to go find John. This is a pain in the ass. <clears throat> Mapsco, wasn't it Mapsco? I don't know. But anyway, John, I, we knew when we were recording The Blue Law that, John wasn't going to be doing the last tour with us. So we had a, a bass player that luckily enough could, could play enough like John that that our last tour was musical and enjoyable, but we did it without John. For me personally, that sucked because once John left, it just really changed the feeling. And I was I was starting to kind of get restless and maybe wanting to leave Austin and I wanted to do something more professional and either go to school and be a teacher or that's when I discovered being a music therapist and had had no problem leaving Austin because Silver Scooter wasn't the same band anymore. Kind of felt like I was in a cover band, honestly. Was that because you had, so because John had left and then you had said earlier that Sean Camp came in and there's also a name Tyler Mallory in Discord? Yeah, t- so Tyler Mallory was a good friend of ours. So first, Sean Camp played music with Tom and I when we were going to school in Pullman, Washington, in Moscow, Idaho. Sean moved away to grad school, and we didn't reunite with Sean musically until Sean got done with grad school, and he moved to Austin, and he joined our band, and we became a four-piece. So Sean was in the band between Orleans Parish and the Blue Law. So Sean recorded the Blue Law with us playing guitar and keyboards. John recorded the Blue Law on bass, but as soon as the album was in the can, he was done playing with us. Tyler, also from Moscow, Idaho, but much younger than us, moved down to Austin. Austin somehow attracted a bunch of people that we knew from Idaho and Washington State. And so Tyler, he's a great musician as well. And so he he just picked up the bass and filled in. It was plenty good enough to play all those songs on on the Blue Law. So when did you guys? Because I know on your on your website you have the last show, and it's at is that in Austin? Uh, yeah, we had our last show in Austin. Probably, probably we went on this tour. I should send you some pictures from this book that I'm talking about because it's really cool. Yeah, I can post them too leading up to the interview. Let me grab the book to see what the dates are of that tour. And then we would have had our last show in Austin when that tour was over. And then I think literally that was at the tail end. I think it was December December of 2001 because it was New Year's Day that I woke up in Portland, Oregon, 2002. Having moved, yeah. So it was April 2001 was the Blue Law Tour. And so we still existed a little bit between April and December of 2001. So how weird was that around that time? Because that's what 9-11 happens three months prior to this show. Well, we were actually touring in Tokyo, Japan. Um, So that's another important bit of our story is um there was a band in tokyo japan called supercar that was on a sony music subsidiary and they somehow discovered silver scooter probably probably pumpkin eyes and so sony music brought 
Silver Scooter over when we were still a trio. No, Sean had just joined the band, so we went over as a four-piece to Tokyo. As soon as we got back from that trip, we went on tour and got dropped by Sony Music in Japan because they decided, as big labels do, they just, ah, we're not going to do this anymore, cut all that stuff. But the people that worked at this, the label, the Sony Music subsidiary, loved Silver Scooter. They said, hang in there. We're going to find a way to release your albums in Japan anyway. So fast forward even a year, and they finally were true to their word. We got released on an indie label in Japan. And to this day, I guess there's a lot of Silver Scooter fans in Japan. So we went over a second time, and that happened to be 9-11. And so we got stuck over there. We weren't on Sony Music's dime this time. We were staying with friends, similar to how you tour in America, sleeping on people's couches. And it was just a really, really anxious time, slowly watching CNN load on the web page, you know, because everything was so archaic and slow in 2001 in terms of the Internet. Like, okay, what's the latest? What's the latest? What's the latest? But we, we learned about 9-11 it was the evening of 9-11 in Tokyo, and we were all at a small bar that was rented out as a private party. I was going out into the alley with some friends in another band that also went over with us. Everybody in, cell phone had, everybody in Tokyo had a cell phone, and they would get little text messages on their phone, which was like, that was crazy to me. I'm like, what do you mean you're getting news on your phone? I don't understand. But by the time it translated from... Japanese to English, it was George Bush has started World War III, and we were watching this little black and white TV in the alley, and it was nighttime in Tokyo, and we could see the Twin Towers, you know, the footage that they just played over and over again, and we're like, what the fuck is that? That is crazy. And then it was like probably six days later that we finally got to fly home. I think we went out to the airport every single day to try to catch a flight. That's fucking crazy that's scary that the narrative out there was that he started to world war three it's just like just shows you how different the news travels all over the world well and that was just translating you know people you know trying to trying to translate that america's under attack the you know i guess the easiest way to explain it was there was a war starting and i don't know it was it was high anxiety, that's for sure. Not like today, where everything's calm. <laughs> yeah, everything is so relaxed today. <laughs> yeah. Nothing with the presidents scaring people. <laughs> oh, <laughs> right now. oh, my God. Um, so, on a, a later note, though, the, the last show that you guys play, how many... I, this, I don't know, this just seems... There's, it seems like there's five of you on stage or am i just not seeing this no there's only four never mind it looked like there was are you a looking at a youtube video yeah yeah so no, it is four. i don't remember how that got posted on there my f- friend miraculously taped the whole thing and later put it on youtube there might be i'm sure john played a little bit and i'm sure tyler played a little bit i've never watched the whole thing to be honest with you so i don't know what you're looking at it's the one on your uh, website. If you go Silver Scooter Last Show on your videos page, it's all the way at the bottom. Um, let me scroll to the same time point you're on, and I can tell you exactly who's on stage with us. The beginning looked like... Oh, no, okay. No, I, there's just, The very beginning, there's a guy in the front just staring at you, and I, for some reason my brain thought he was on stage, but he's just in the crowd. So it is just four of you. And your bass player's got like long hair and glasses... And I think a washburn. Yeah. Let me let me see. Yeah, I put the video up, but I haven't uh <laughs> You didn't look at it. I'm not gonna watch that. If you just if you pause at like thirty twelve or like thirty yeah, like thirty minutes something it gives you like a, a decent all four of you. Well you know what's interesting is I just went to the video section of my own website. Oh, they finally started to load. I'm like, there's no videos on here. What are you talking about? At the very, very beginning, that's the Kiss Offs on stage, another Peekaboo band. And that's Travis, Travis Higdon on the far, far left. 
with the dark sweater on, that's Travis Higdon who runs Peekaboo. He was in the Kiss Offs. Yeah, I see Tyler playing bass with us. Somebody doing like devil horns in front of him about 23 minutes in. And then towards the end, I just fast forwarded to 43 minutes. Tyler's still on stage. It looks like it's the I'm like at the end. It looks like it's just the entire the same lineup the yeah, entire time. Yeah, I don't yeah. think Tyler played with this, which maybe that's just because we wouldn't have been prepared to have John play with this. We've done a couple uh, reunion shows in Austin over the last ten or fifteen years, and they uh, John plays half and Tyler plays half. When was the last time you guys did that? We let's see. We did an unofficial South by Southwest gig in two thousand five, and then. I did a, when I moved back from Australia in 2016, I think we played a show. How was that when you guys did that? Super fun. That's cool. Super hard though, because like I was telling you earlier, singing in that high register is really uh, not uh, easy for me. Yeah. Yeah. The older you get, I mean, you just, you're so far away from that. Yeah. I'm a long way from those songs. So, (laughs) um, I do want to touch on the Super Double X Man for a little bit, and I also want to talk about Tiny uh, Tiny Desk Concert because that's really cool. The video. Oh yeah. Um, but before that, so was that video of? Did you guys decide that was your last show, or did it just happen to be your last show that someone happened to videotape? I think I think somebody happened to just. I think it probably was announced as our last show because I think I knew at that time that I was moving. So I think we, I think, I think probably word of mouth, we just said, hey, this is going to be Silver Scooter's last show because Scott's leaving town. I think I left town the next day. Yeah, because you said you ended up in Portland on January 1st or something like that? Yeah, January 1st, I was already there. Oh, wow. Yeah, because this is, this says the show is on December 9th, so it kind of gives you a little timeline. So, okay, um, to slowly start kind of wrapping this up, though, but then you stick with Super Double X, man. So h- did you want to change gears on how you grew that band? Or you're like, okay, well, I don't want to I don't want to follow the same blueprint that Silver Scooter did with the touring and this, or you're like, I'm actually going to 10X that and go bigger on that? It was more like we started the interview. I've, I've just always been driven to, to create. I just, songs live in me, they come out periodically and i just catalog them somehow so super double x man was the way i was cataloging songs and releasing albums and i got lucky i was i was um associated with a couple small labels in portland one being hush and one being tender living empire they helped me put out some albums that were important one being a 10th anniversary i <laughs> The tenth album that Super Double X Man did was a recording of my favorite Super Double X Man song. So like a re-recording. Like Super Double X Man, ten years of Super Double X Man through the eyes of the current version of Super Double X Man, which was a band. And that caught the ear of Bob Boylan at NPR's All Songs Considered, and he became a fan. And that's how the Tiny Desk concert came about. That's cool. Was that I mean, I just started really paying attention to that recently because some bands that I like will be on there like this band turnstile is pretty popular now and they just played on there but for the last i'd say four or five years ago it caught my attention and i didn't realize it was going on for so long yeah i mean i was i was early days of the tiny desk concerts there was there was nobody watching me maybe linda wertheimer came in to sneak a piece of pizza or something like that while i was playing but it was pretty much bob his staff a couple other people and another artist that was always all, all, also recording a Tiny Desk concert that same day. How big is that room? Like where everyone's standing? It's tiny. Yeah, like literally. It's tiny. Yeah, it's tiny. Probably 20 people would make that place feel pretty darn full. That's crazy. I think Usher, yeah, he just did it recently with like a whole group. Yeah, now him. with the, the whole Tiny Desk concert contest and everything people freak out when i say that i've done a tiny desk concert but believe me back in 2009 or 10 when i did that it was tiny uh it was not a big deal (laughs) well it's like kind of like hot ones do you watch hot ones at all Mm -mm. oh my god they this guy interviews people while they eat hot wings and they get increasingly hot and he asks great questions 
and they started off by just interviewing YouTube celebrities and rappers and things, and now they're interviewing just gigantic superstars. But it's still the same premise, and it's so fan fucking tastic. It's I lo- I love watching it all the time. Yeah, that sounds cool. Yeah, but it's that, like that thing where yeah, it's like you start off with this small indie thing, and then after a while, I think if something the premise of it, I think if it's if it's a solid premise. And it stays longevity sometimes just catches fire at one point and then it just like hockey sticks and everyone's like oh my god this is my favorite thing and you're like this has been going on for like 15 20 years where the hell were you then yeah that's how it goes so if 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 pumpkin eyes was to silver scooter if if pumpkin eyes was silver scooter sort of signature song super double x man had a signature song too and that was collecting rocks so that song is kind of like everybody's gateway into the world of my lesser known music. It's like, Oh, that song collecting rocks. And yep. That one's got, yeah, that one's got just a thousand more than grace on Spotify. But those are the two big ones. Yeah. Grace was in a fairly big indie movie. What movie? Uh, some kind of horror movie. I can't remember what it was called. And I never watched, I never got to see it cause it was, sort of before YouTube and before streaming services. I have no idea. If, I'd have to look through my emails to maybe try to find a contract where they bought that song from me. They're like, can we make one change to it? And I'm like, what? And they're like, well, we need to make it longer. I'm like, <laughs> okay. You <laughs> make it longer. <laughs> You're like, no, it's the damn song. <laughs> like, you know, whatever. Was there like a significance of you going to Portland, then Australia, then going back to, then going to San Francisco? Was that like, it was the band part of that? Or was that just kind of like a, just life journey, figuring life, shit out? Life changing, divorce, and yeah, fa- family transitioning. Australia was amazing. I wouldn't change it for anything, but it, it was um, my marriage at the time. I don't, I don't think we were quite prepared for how hard that was going to be for us. Um, we're really good co-parents today for sure. And I have a lot of respect for my, uh, kid's mom for sure. But I'm, I'm remarried and very happy and in a much different place than, than I was then. One amazing, one amazing thing about Australia and Super Double X Man was before Courtney Barnett was a household name in the world, she was doing small gigs like I was. And so we got to be friends and a Super Double X Men album called Sword of Heavy Metal was actually her first first album on her on her label. And she doesn't even mention Super Double X Men anymore. And you can't find it listed on any of her website type stuff, which kind of bums me out. But um, what's the video about then? The, the video was um, I was crowdfunding to put out an LP, which was going to be on Courtney's label, but I was going to pay for everything she didn't she didn't have any way to pay for my album to be manufactured and released on her label but she helped me do some crowdfunding and she helped me organize that concert so the video of her and her partner Jen Cloer was an idea that she had where Scott we're going to get a bunch of people to learn your songs and you're going to play a set and then everybody's going to just treat it as be kind of like an open mic where we're going to come up and do versions of your songs. So she and Jen Clower did that version of a super double X man song called box store. Yeah. I'd love to see her again. I haven't, she's kind of like a uh, fast becoming my Bob mold story. Like, I don't know if I'll ever get a chance to speak with her again. I'll have to give her a note one of these days at the merch table and see if I can get an audience with her. All right, man. So before I wrap this up, is there, I'm going to ask two questions at the end, but before I do that, is there a story that you've always wanted to tell that you've never told in an interview? Now you get your chance to. No, I think the Bob Mould story and my, um, and my Courtney Barnett story were two and, and, the um, getting stuck in Japan. Those, those three things were probably the most interesting musical run-ins that I've ever had or musical related escapades. Okay. That works. Um, well, cool. So last two questions uh, before I ask the last one. What would you like to plug? It could be about you. It could be about something cool a friend of yours is doing. It could be about both. Mm. Man. Boy, if you're out there and you have a family and you have kids, uh, hold those kids close and help them through whatever 
anxiety they might be experiencing because I think young people everywhere are more anxious than ever. So love your kids. That's what I'd like to plug. And if you want to learn more about my music, please do so by visiting my website and signing up on my mailing list. Actually, I'm going to do that right now actually i didn't i didn't see follow him i didn't see the mail follow list. me on instagram or or something because that's that's the only way i have to stay in touch with people anymore i don't have a label that i work with i don't i don't have any kind of team helping me the way i used to making making my music reach people it's just it's just me and my and my wife helps me edit my blog <laughs> i take it diy all the way man <laughs> <laughs> actually uh just technically i just tried to sign up on for your web your email and it's not bringing me like a thank you page or should i get an email saying i just you'll get up? an email and you'll probably have to check your junk mail okay i'll have to ask my web hosting company which is banzoogle if there's a way to get around that because uh you know usually people signing up i'm not signing people up so usually if you're signing up yourself I don't know, why do you have to go through so many hoops to say, yes, I did intend to sign up for this? Yeah, because it usually tells you, if you like a thank you or something like, oh, you're up this now, or I'm looking at my email. So it might be something to look into because people might be trying to sign up and they're not able to technically. Yeah, I'll do that right now. Yeah, there's also a company called AppSumo and they have a free, or Sumo Me, it's a free pop-up that gets people's emails too. Or that you can, oh, really? yeah, you can embed it, but you can also just be, It'll pop up on your website, which can be annoying, but if you're on a website where you want to, it could be like, hey, sign up for like updates on songs and stuff. If people are there and they're going out of their way to get to your website, they probably are like, oh, I want to be a part of this. And you can collect way more emails that way. Just kind of a little tip that I've used over from working for myself for many years. I, th I, think, uh, I think at this point, I, if people find my music, it's great. I'm very happy. Cool, man. All right. Well, last question. Uh, what scene ethics do you hold on to to this day? Uh, probably the DIY uh, aspect of it. Um, I have my blood, sweat, and tears in every aspect of the creative process from, from writing and recording and producing the music to the vehicle that I choose to you know, used to share the music and that that's never changed for me from my days of going to Kinko's and making cassette covers and flyers for shows. I still do it the same way, which is probably why I don't have very many fans. 